As we all know, last week a US Reaper drone was downed after an incident involving Russian Su-27 fighter jets. So some questions arise. Why has Russia messed with the US drone? Will it do it again? Why did the incident involve a Reaper drone and not more potent US recon platforms? And why hasn't Russia been messing with NATO aircraft even earlier, since the start of the war? Those are all tough but valid questions, and this video will try to shed a bit of light on at least some of them. As the war rages on and Russia and US are at loggerheads over the lost US drone, Euro-Asian markets are in constant turmoil. Energy and housing prices remain at historic highs. That has caused investments in stocks and bonds to lose up to 25% in 2022, near record losses. But Masterworks, sponsoring this video, can help. In 2022, they handed back over $25 million to their investors. The major banks are offering advisory services for buying fine art, something Masterworks already specializes in. Global institutions recently increased their holdings of alternative assets. Thanks to Masterworks, regular investors can now join in and invest in physical paintings qualified with the SEC. Masterworks has over 650,000 users and 11 sold paintings. The last one returned 35% net to investors. Maybe one of you who already signed up. Each Masterworks deal has so far returned over 9%. Their paintings have sold out in less than an hour. But using the link below the video, you're given special access. Back to our video now. First to sum up what happened during last week's drone incident. The US said the drone was flying 75 miles off the Crimean coast. Russia said it was around 35 miles away. Ukraine's officials said the drone finally hit the water 30 miles off the coast. The drone was obviously flying over international waters. Those extend some 14 miles from outlying coastline points. Russia said it had warned of a special operational zone extending farther out from Crimea due to military ops. But such zones are self-proclaimed and are really useful more to let civilian air traffic know they might be at risk if they fly close. Of course, the entire Crimea is, in the eyes of the US, de jure not Russian, but Ukrainian airspace. But de facto, the US does seem to accept it as Russian airspace for now, as it carefully avoids getting too close to it. And during the entire war, it was mindful not to fly its air assets anywhere inside Ukrainian borders. We do know from the DoD footage that close passes and fuel spraying were deliberate. No one flies that close to another aircraft and ejects fuel on accident, multiple times. So at the very least, the Russian idea was to mess with the US drone, perhaps to shower it with fuel, perhaps to fly so close to it that the airstream over the Reaper's wings would get messed up in the wake of the bigger and faster Russian jet, and thus that the drone would lose lift or would otherwise be somehow affected and perhaps that its commander would abort the mission. According to the US Air Force, two Suhois followed the drone for half an hour and did 19 close passes to the drone. Last three or four passes involved spraying the drone with fuel. Fighter jets have the ability to eject excess fuel in flight. In order to keep the fuel from dispersing, such passes were done extremely close to the drone. Those are all quite dangerous moves. Unless the whole thing was decided only by pilots themselves, and unless pilots are clueless, it should have been known such acts have a very high chance of actually disrupting the drone to the point that a crash is possible. Which leads us to why has Russia messed with the drone? Firstly, was it done by Russia, as in was it Putin's orders? Or was it orders from some high air force commander? Or orders from a lower level commander instructing the pilot? Or was it simply a spur of the moment decision on behalf of a reckless and temperamental pilot? We do have the US Air Force claim that the Russian planes flew close to the Reaper and harassed it for half an hour before the incident happened. With both Sukhois doing the same passes, it's unlikely it was just one pilot's decision. Also, Russian pilots are trained not to be as free in decision-making as NATO pilots. In a high-stakes incident like this, NATO pilots too would not do anything on their own, but still, the institutional culture of Russian pilots' training makes the likelihood of the incident being the pilot's decision very low. Now, low-level and high-level commander decisions are more likely. What's unlikely is that the decision came from the very high levels of government, because the war has been going on for over a year now. 
and the US and its allies have flown literally thousands of recon missions very close to Ukraine's border and very close to Crimea. Also, the Reaper drone is far from the most potent recon plane the US has. The location where the Reaper was, as well as the moment of the incident, didn't really matter that much to Russia. Not compared to, for example, October and November of 2022, when Russian forces were withdrawing for nearby Kherson. Such a moment may have warranted a greater reaction from Russia against NATO recon assets that were helping feed Ukraine with data. A big indication of the nature of the decision would be if downing of US drones start repeating. Then it would be very clear it's a change in strategy, which would then have to come from high up levels. Now, crashing into a drone and just flying close are two different things. We already have sort of an indication a decision to start flying close may have been made in weeks before. John Kirby, US National Security Council spokesman, said that in recent weeks Russian planes were performing similar close-by intercepts of US drones at several different occasions, but without getting so close to cause a crash. That suggests there may have already been a change in Russian thinking with this incident being an accident. But future months will likely show what's going on better. Messing with a single drone and a Reaper at that is not going to help Russia much, if at all. That one drone likely represents well less than 1% of recon capabilities that US and allies have around Ukraine. At the same time, the intercept produced an international incident. It may cause the US to double down on recon missions near Ukraine, or to help Ukraine in some other way. The Russian goal might have been to deliberately crash the drone, thinking that it would result in US not flying their drones as close in the future. But unless Russia is ready to go nuclear, escalating the problems in relationship with US is not really wise. Russia has much more to lose if US was to get more directly involved in the conflict. Again to stress, unless the conflict turns into a nuclear one, where everyone loses. Why was the Reaper drone chosen? Well, it's the lowest hanging fruit. Reapers can't really fly high up. This one was flying at its typical cruise altitude of 25,000 feet. At most, a Reaper can fly 50,000 feet, but not for as long, or while carrying the same sort of payload. Russian flankers can fairly easily reach 50,000 feet, as their service ceiling is at some 60,000 feet. Messing with the US RQ-4 Global Hawk drone would be harder as those fly at 60,000 feet, where the flanker too would have limited controllability and would be close to stall speeds. Global Hawks carry much more potent recon sensors, which include radar, optical and thermal sensors, some of which offer meter or two resolution at distances of 60 or so miles. Reaper's sensors are generally weaker, with the drone having to be closer to the recon area to maintain the same resolution. Plus, Reaper has to carry its most potent sensors spotted, which means it can't use both the high power optics and a radar sensor in the same mission. The US has even more potent intelligence gathering aircraft. It has the U-2 spy plane, with even better sensors. Its optical sensor can allegedly achieve 1 meter resolution from 190 miles away. It can also carry a radar-based imager if the mission requires it but the U-2 flies at a whopping 80,000 feet. That's an altitude that regular fighter jets simply can't fly at, while remaining controllable. NATO also has a myriad of various other manned platforms, AVAX, various electronic signal gathering planes, and so on. Over the months of the war, NATO officials did mention many NATO planes are always near Belarus and Ukraine's border, gathering information. Tracking some of those is possible, as they have to keep their transponders online while flying in dense commercial airspace. On average, at least half a dozen large recon planes fly each day around Ukraine, Crimea included. That's not counting planes with their transponders off, nor medium-sized platforms like Reaper drones. Endangering a manned plane, however, is a whole other political matter. The fact we've had hints of intercepts just against drones seems to show that Russia is not actually willing to risk escalation with these intercepts, and may keep doing them just against drones. Will they go bigger and try to mess with the more potent and much more expensive Global Hawk drones? It's plausible, as such a drone was actually down on purpose with a missile by Iran in 2019. The US did not react to that militarily. 
The US said the drone was in international airspace. Iran said it was in Iranian airspace. But even if the US looks away at one or two crashed drones, it is not assured it will keep looking away if it keeps happening regularly. If a systematic effort is made by the Russians to keep crashing drones, the US would very likely be forced to respond and potentially escalate. So after all this, why did Russia cause the crash of the drone? Well, it's impossible to know for sure, but if such accidents don't happen again, Binko is inclined to believe contact itself may have been an accident. Again, the US Air Force said Russian planes did several passes dosing the drone with fuel. Interceptions like these have also allegedly happened in weeks before, so this may have been a situation where one pilot simply miscalculated and went too far. Or better said, too close. And instead of scaring away the drone operator with the drone covered in jet fuel, which could be dangerous in itself and cause the commander to cut its mission short, the Russian pilot accidentally clipped the propeller and caused it to crash outright. All those recon planes near Crimea are likely a huge thorn in Russia's side. But there really isn't a whole lot that Russia can do about those. Bringing NATO planes down on a regular basis so often that NATO conveys less information to Ukraine is a non-starter. Such escalation is something Putin showed he's not ready for, as he would have escalated to such a level much earlier if he believed otherwise. Using non-lethal assets against sensors on planes themselves, that's something the Russian Air Force seems incapable of doing. They seem to lack enough special planes to keep intercepting most NATO recon assets. Special planes in that context would be ones capable of either jamming NATO radars from point-blank range and illuminating optical sensors on NATO planes with lasers to temporarily blind them. Doing all that against high-flying, fast-flying planes requires gimbaled precise lasers and powerful jammers. Both of those are in very high demand and Russia hasn't got nearly enough such platforms to use over the battlefield against Ukraine let alone to spare some to periodically mess with NATO recon. Even if it could somehow mess with half of NATO recon planes, NATO would still have hundreds of various government and commercial satellites aiding in intelligence gathering mission. So even a concentrated systematic effort on the Russian part is not doable nor sustainable. Which is another indication that last week's downing of the drone was more of a one-off unplanned accident possibly stemming from some mid-level commander's choice to stick it up to the Americans by scaring the drones away. The weeks to follow will show if similar behavior will continue.